All right, good afternoon. That's exactly what it's like to work inside Microsoft every day. <laughs> so I want to thank everyone on this gorgeous day for coming down to the lowest subterranean level of the conference center at the end of the day. I really appreciate it. A um, couple of quick administrative issues. Uh, you were giving uh, cards as you were coming in. We are going to draw a couple of Microsoft bands right near the end. Not at the very end, but like five, ten minutes before the end. And uh, I'll need a volunteer from the audience to do that drawing. So think about the enthusiastic response you're going to have when I say I need a volunteer, and you can prepare for the next hour uh, for that response. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, I'll also uh, be building sort of an app portal uh, here on stage. And uh, if anyone in here is from healthcare and uh, would like to be part of that with me, um, I'll also look for a volunteer for that. So also think about your enthusiastic response there. Uh, so I'm going to talk just a teeny weeny bit about myself, just so you know who I am. Uh, today's presentation is a mixture of uh, we have about three or four videos, um, all very future focused. Um, one will show you some stuff that we're um, just about to launch uh, that you've probably heard about. Uh, a couple will um, talk about perception and reality, because a lot of what we're going to talk about today will be interface. Uh, interface design, perception, reality, holographs, a whole bunch of stuff like that, and, and really how you create interface uh, models that will actually improve productivity in your enterprise. So that's kind of a sort of general theme. Um, I'm also going to show you, right near the end, um, a video from Microsoft Research that's a tiny peek into probably what it'll be like in about 10 years. And it's a piece of it's a working prototype um, computer system that will, I think, be pretty exciting for most of you. And it's not been shown publicly very often. So, uh, so it'll be, that'll be kind of fun. As well, I've got about six demos I'm going to do. I'm actually going to walk through, show you what app portals are, uh, talk about how they work, give you various examples from theater to CIO summits to Intel, and, and in fact, the one that I use every day to run my own business. So I'll sort of, we'll go through that. Um, the entire network in the Congress Center went down about 15 minutes before this presentation, so I was excited. I thank my team, Praveen, Mike, I guess that was awesome. Uh, we have multiple backups on the stage, so I'm confident we're going to get through it, no problem. Um, but um, I had to run back to my room to get my backup and run all the way back, so I'm just kind of currently in sort of cool down phase right now. <laughs> Good exercise. Uh, and, then, um, uh, and then I will actually show you how to uh, kind of construct a prototype app portal and talk a little bit about how to build them. So we're going to have a relatively full session here. I'll move relatively quickly. If I do something or say something that piques your interest or you, know, you really sort of got to know, feel free to throw your hand up. Um, I will try to catch it. If you throw your hand up and go, ooh, then I'll hear you more uh, overtly. And if you go, uh, uh, it's probably too old a reference. We'll see if anyone gets that. If you go, Mr. Cotter. Yeah, okay. okay, a few, a few, okay, good. Uh, then I'll definitely hear you. So um, feel free to, to jump in. I'm ha I, don't, I don't mind. It's not highly scripted. I don't have notes or anything. We're just going to be kind of having some fun talking about app portals and going through the presentation. So here's a little bit about uh, me. And uh, oop, there we go. Um, and so this is, uh, this is me in my internet underpants. Uh, my executive assistant, uh, Elise, who's here and been helping out, she was taking things at the door. It's been you know, incredible help. Um, when she looked at this photo, she said, hey, wait a second, that's David Beckham's body. And, uh, and I said, uh, no, it's not. <laughs> you just never see me in my internet underpants. Uh, so, uh, so just kind of a few things about me, some really quick sort of things. So I have one wife, and um, uh, she's pleased to hear that always uh, when I bring that up. Um, but uh, my wife and I have been together a long time. We're each other's first date. Uh, so been together for a very long time. We have two children. Uh, both teenage daughters, um, one in university, one just about to go. Uh, I've sold three companies. So as an entrepreneur, before I joined Microsoft, uh, and I did four startups. So you'll notice that the four is bigger than the three. So if you ever want to buy me a beer and hear about number four, I'm always happy to talk about that one and, and cry a little bit. Um, I've been, um, uh, I was for five years I was in Microsoft Research. Uh, that's how I started in the company. And then um, I've now moved in to lead the marketing function uh, in the U.S. So I'm the uh, head of the central marketing organization for the U.S. Uh, subsidiary. Um, I've been, I have six cars. Um, my, the newest was built in 1987, and the oldest was built in 1967. So uh, I can talk about those at length, but my favorite one is a DeLorean, and I've owned that one for seven years. I have eight devices uh, that I use on a regular basis. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go through interface. I've been at Microsoft for nine years, and I started my career a million zillion years ago uh, at Procter Gamble, and I was there for a decade. I had a had a wonderful time. So that's kind of me by the numbers. There, um, there will be a test on this at the end. Okay. 
So, um, so what I'm going to do is uh, talk a little bit about um, Windows app portals. And uh, some of the sort of the theme that I'm going to use here for a second will be holographs. And I don't know how many of you have been staying checked into the Windows 10 announcements, but there was an announcement about a month ago uh, because we're starting to release some of the code. In the code, there's a whole bunch of stuff for holographic projections. Uh, and that is actually to support a product called uh, HoloLens. Okay? Um, some people call it HoloLens and HoloLens, and there's a whole bunch of pronunciations already coming out, but it's holographic, so HoloLens. And, um, and I want to talk a little bit about that because um, there's, there's a real vision of going into the future. So I want to kind of go into the future together with you right now and start to think about what happens to interface design when it's floating in the air in front of you. It's very different. And so a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about at Portals is a way of preparing people to have more focused and um, sort of simplistic interfaces that they can use in a universe where holographs are part of how we, we interact with the world. Um, so, uh, I think I want to spend just a second playing the video. This is public, so you can get this, I think, on YouTube. But just so to kind of orient everyone on what HoloLens is, this is the current sort of early spec of what we think we're going to be releasing. Look around. Technology is all around us. We use it in every aspect of our lives. It enables us to do amazing things. What if we could go further? What if we could go beyond the screen? Where your digital world is blended with your real world. Now we can. This is the world with holograms. What will they enable us to do? New ways to visualize our work. I have an idea for the fuel tank. New ways to share ideas with each other. How are things going your end? I just put the images in OneDrive. Perfect. More immersive ways to play. New ways to teach and learn. So put the new trap in the place of the old one. Now what? And tighten here and here. New ways to collaborate and explore the places we've never been. Look at this formation. Let's take a closer look. And new ways to create the things we imagine. Because when you change the way you see the world, you can change the world you see. This is Microsoft HoloLens. Yeah, I've been in my career, uh, I've been in, in the technology sector in my career for most of my career, and I have never seen a more exciting time to be in technology. It's just incredible. And part of what we're starting to do as an industry is we're starting to go through transformative shifts in the way that we uh, interact with applications, the way that we interact with interfaces, and quite frankly, the way that we interact with each other. So I want to talk about this model of what I call Copernican shift. Uh, and um, I'm going to, this will be like uh, the mandatory academic um, portion of the presentation. Uh, and uh, you're, you're, you're more than welcome to you know, go on your phone or something for a few minutes if you like. Um, but again, um, uh, there will be also be a test on this as well, so just, just to be warned. Um, so um, with, that, with Copernican shift is, you know, for me, a really neat way to think about what's happening and to frame and to put context around what we sense, like the changes that we sense that are out there. So um, most of you, I'm sure, are intimately familiar with the life and times of uh, Copernicus. Um, so I probably don't need to go at length, but for maybe one person in the audience who's not. Uh, Copernicus uh, lived and died. He died in 1543. Uh, he's generally credited with kicking off the scientific revolution. Uh, and and the, kind of the story of how he kicked off the scientific revolution, I think, is a, a pretty interesting story because you know, he didn't really actually invent anything. Uh, so he is the, the founder of the science movement, but not because he actually discovered 
um, anything new. What he did is he allowed society to unlock discovery by effectively mapping perception to reality. Okay. So uh, the world that uh, Copernicus grew up in, um, in the uh, 1400s, was a world uh, dominated by a worldview of the Ptolemaic universe. Um, and Ptolemaic universe sort of basically decreed that the Earth was the center of the universe. Okay? And the sun and moon rotated around it. And quite frankly, you know, if you stand in a field for a couple of days, I've done this a few times, stand in a field a couple of days, and you walk you know, in the morning, the sun appears to go up and go around and go away. And then the next morning, it goes up in the same place and goes around and goes away again. And I, the Earth doesn't seem to be moving. It seems very logical that this is the way the world actually works. And so not only was this sort of the world view, the church had also decided that this is the view of the universe and that anyone who disagreed with this view of the universe uh, was a heretic. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with heretics and heresy, but uh, just generally speaking, it's a bad thing. You don't want to be, in the 1400s, you don't want to be a heretic uh, for the Catholic Church. Now, um, so Copernicus, um, he was like, um, he was actually a deacon in the church and he was given the job of trying to improve astronomical calculations because they were trying to um, always predict when Easter would occur based on position of sun and planets, and they were never quite right. They got a little closer over time, but they never got it quite right. And they kept layering calculations on top of calculations. It sounds like a lot of the stuff we hear about today as we're trying to understand gravity, calculation on top of calculation. And it was, got very complex, and it got a little better, but never quite right. And they could never explain things like the retrograde motion of Mars and a whole bunch of other celestial motions. And so you know, Copernicus worked on this for quite a while and came up with this idea that you know, maybe, maybe this is what's going on. Um, Earth's going around the sun. And in fact, when you take this view of the universe, all the calculations fall in place. Everything's explainable. Suddenly, everything starts to make sense. Okay. And today, um, most of us, although if you go online, not all of us, but most of us would view this as the, the world that we live in now. And of course, it had basically unlocked a scientific explosion, because suddenly you could actually make calculations, people understand the universe, and started this idea of what is perception, what is reality, and how do we actually match those. Um, you know, Copernicus was a pretty smart guy, too. He was um, kind of not super keen on the whole heresy idea. And so what he did is he wrote it, uh, but he waited for the, uh, the publishing of his book uh, occurred on his death. That was how he did it. That's how super cool way to escape, you know, being tortured. Uh, and they, the legend is they handed him the book as he died, first edition. And uh, then it circulated. It took a long time. You know, back then information moved more slowly. But within about 50, 60 years, you know, this sort of broke through and, you know, uh, off we went from there. And that's why we're all sitting here today. So I love this idea of perception and reality and shifts and stuff like that. So I want to talk about some shifts we're going through right now today. And I would like to kind of apply this Copernican model all the time. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to play kind of like a little fun video, which is another video that kind of plays with perception and reality. And I think it starts to kind of, kind of poke a little bit at the issue of what is reality and what is, how does our perception affect it? So uh, I'm going to play this. I'm going to narrate over it for a moment um, just because it's just started. So this is an ad from uh, Argentina. And it's, uh, you may not have seen it, but it's an LG ad. Uh, and they're basically setting up a fake office. And so uh, there's a TV, and uh, they're kind of cutting a hole in the office, and they're, they're kind of putting this whole TV together. And what they're going to do is they're going to take the TV and they're going to stick it in the office. They put a fake wall up, and now they're basically creating this fake window made out of the LG TV. And they put in some cameras and stuff to kind of watch the hilarity. And so what, what they're doing here is they're um, bringing people for job interviews, and as they come in, um, as they look behind the interviewer, they see what appears to be a window to the outside. And you know, three feet further on, that is exactly the view from the building. Um, and then they do something kind of interesting, and some will find this not amusing, but um, I find it hilarious. So we'll see what happens. Bueno, principalmente que... So 
it's all dark here, and then boom. Again, again. <laughs> oh, no. man. Surprise, you're in camera camera. <laughs> this guy's not happy. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 this never gets old for me. I don't know what it is. I, and, and, but again, it's like basically the LG point is our TVs are so lifelike you can't tell them from reality. Uh, I love how you know, one person was just like, screw you and the horse you ran in on. And, uh, and the other two are kind of like generally relieved that the world hasn't ended. So I, I thought that was kind of neat. Um, but I think for me, what's interesting about that, it really is like what is perception and reality. And effectively, our brains interpret things as real even when they're not. And uh, that, to me, is a very interesting part of kind of being human. So let's talk a little bit about perception and reality in technology. And the first thing I want to talk about is something that actually this conference is touching on in pretty interesting ways, which is we have tended in the industry to have a very IT-centric view of the universe. Um, and that the sort of the mainframe and the user sort of circulate around it and they circulate around IT. Uh, and then there's been this, you know, kind of Gartner's been talking about this a lot, but this sort of rising trend of the, of the CXO or the business decision maker who is, you know, basically more task focused and a set of tasks are again focusing, are really rotating around the user. And there have been this, like, I think, kind of clash of these orbits, you know, is it IT or is it BT? And what we're really seeing is it's really the rise of the buying committee. Uh, it's really not one or the other. It's really kind of a, a unified set of orbits, you know, between the two. And I think, for me, this is a big shift that's happening. And as I talk about app portals, I'll talk a little bit about how we've seen app portals effectively bridge what has traditionally sometimes been a divide between these business technology decision makers and these information technology decision makers. And I'll talk a little bit about those stories. So that's kind of one thing for me that's been really interesting as a, a key trend uh, in our industry. Uh, the second thing is really uh, kind of on UI. You know, we all started on keyboards. Many of us still use keyboards. And very much in a keyboard-centric universe, you are effectively using the keyboard as your input device, and you're conforming your input style to the keyboard's requirements. Now, I think most people know this, but a QWERTY keyboard is designed for a mechanical typewriter. Right? And the way that the keys are placed on a QWERTY keyboard is designed to minimize the, um, the mechanical striking arms chance of hitting another striking arm. Because when you type very quickly on a mechanical typewriter, the striking arms get close to each other, they'll jam. And so that's why a QWERTY keyboard is the way it is. It's effectively optimized to be least convenient for the human inputter. Because effectively, the letters you use most often are the most far spaced from each other. If you think about that for a second. Now, some of you may have already reconfigured like Dvorak keyboards and all that kind of stuff. There's some new ones coming out where you stick your hands in the globe and it sucks your fingers in and stuff. But, uh, but that's our kind of keyboards, right? It's a very keyboard-centric universe. It's a very unnatural act in a way, uh, although we've gotten very used to it. Uh, then, you know, GUI came out. You know, the, the mouse, you know, introduced by uh, Macintosh in 1984. Um, although someone put the word Windows on here, I, just to get it through, right? So, but, you know, let's face it, the Mac invented the mouse. <laughs> it's like pretend. Um, anyway, so, but, you know, we obviously adopted the GUI, and, uh, you know, really, you think about products like Excel and Word, you know, what did they supplant, right? So the first spreadsheet was not Excel, not by a long shot. The first spreadsheet was Lotus 1, 2, 3. Right? Um, and I drive a Lotus Esprit. What a coincidence. Um, and uh, no relation. Um, but uh, Lotus 123, you know, what happened to Lotus 123? They stayed in a DOS context, they stayed in a keyboard command context. And you know, some of us who started computing early still use keyboard commands for all sorts of stuff. And the Lotus folks were like, keyboard commands are way faster. But GUI won there. Okay, what was the number one word processor? WordPerfect. Everybody used WordPerfect. Yeah. But Word adopted GUI, WordPerfect didn't, was you know, slow to the party, and then you know, kind of the sort of history was made. And so this has been sort of the, the, sort of the story of the last 20 years. Where we are right now, and what I think is incredibly exciting, and this again was really initiated by Apple again, okay, uh, which is the iPhone. The iPhone came out with touch. Right? And so we're basically in the, the beginning of natural user interface. If you look at the HoloLens ad you, you, uh, you, uh, or YouTube video, you see that people are looking at things. That's called gaze. A gaze is a type of natural user interface. You know, motioning, you can do this to open the start screen. Um, my voice is a natural thing. Writing with a, with a pen, you know, like 
the Surface Pro is a very pen-centric device. Uh, circle things, very natural to do. And so basically what's happening is computers are melting away and we're becoming much more human again and not being sort of forced into natural acts. And so that to me is sort of one of the, I think, super fascinating parts of what's going on in our society right now. Did I hear a Mr. Cotter? No? Okay. Um, and then the last thing, and this is, I think, where we're the earliest, is that we have tended to focus on applications as being the thing that people launch. You launch an application to do something. But in fact, users actually don't want to launch applications. What users really want to do is users want to do things. I don't want to open Word. I want to update my resume. Right? I don't want to open Excel. I want to balance my budget. And so this idea of task-centric versus uh, sort of application-centric is very interesting. And I'll show you how some people are starting to kind of do that with app portals. And that, for me, is the last really interesting switch. So now I'm going to kind of go through what are Windows app portals. I'm kind of going to introduce these relatively quickly. I'm going to go through like just three or four slides really fast just to kind of frame it. And then the next, rest of this presentation, I'm just going to show demos and just sort of walk through a whole bunch of these things. And we'll see how that turns out. All right, so um, first thing is I want to say is that the way to think about these, we call this the layer cake diagram, is uh, think about these as descending start screens. So you're all familiar with Windows 7 and, you know, or OS 10 or any kind of traditional OS. In those OSs, you can create subfolders and nest them inside folders. We all know how to do that. It's very easy to do. It wasn't functionality right away at the very beginning, but, you know, very quickly came that functionality and that's the way we are today. Um, we can do the same thing now with start screens, which is you can nest start screens underneath. And these can actually drill far down. And I'll show an app portal inside an app portal inside an app portal in the demo. And, and the cool thing is you're doing all this at the OS. And I'll talk about why that's sort of interesting. Now, one thing people don't always know about Windows 8 is it's got this thing called kiosk mode that you can take any Windows 8 machine and put it into a kiosk mode, which means that the you know, commands disappear around the edges and it just operates like your Delta kiosk when you're checking in to take off. So you know, in kiosk mode, the app portal is the interface. Um, and FedEx, as an example, is a customer who has done that. Uh, if you fly in Alaska, uh, on Alaska, they have these new Windows machines, so Toshiba machines. Um, those are app portals. You turn it on, there's no way to get to the start menu. There's no way to kind of, all you can do is use the Alaska Next application that's on that machine. That's an app portal. Uh, you're starting to see it more and more. So uh, that's sort of, think about that a little bit. Now, one of the coolest things about this is that the whole thing is running on the OS. So basically, anything that runs on Windows will run in an app portal. So when we talk to a customer about app portals, we have a tendency, just because the way we are, to show a lot of our stuff, right? And so the first question someone will say is like, yeah, I use PeopleSoft, or I use SAP, or I use uh, Salesforce, or you know, I'm using other products as well. Uh, if I want to put everything in one place, will those work inside the app portal as well? And so you know, my answer to that is always a question, which is, well, do those things run on Windows? And I was like, well, yes. I'm like, they will run in an app portal, because the app portal is running at the fundamental OS level. Okay, so don't, don't forget that. The other thing about being sort of in the OS level is that Windows app portals are effectively built in a feature as a feature in Windows 8. These are free. Whereas there's, no, I'm not gonna, there's no license to sign. If you have Windows 8, you can make app portals out of it. And uh, the instructions to do it are on Microsoft.com, and you can download those for free, too. And so we'll talk a little bit about that as we kind of keep going through it. But it's not a, it's not a thing to buy, so to speak. Um, the second thing is that when you deploy a modern OS like Windows 8, Windows 10 coming up, is you uh, create a corporate app store and use that to distribute applications to the enterprise. Uh, in that context, it's very easy to update it. So what's cool about it is it's effectively an operating system, but it's delivered as an app. So you can upload it, you can change it, you can update it, and you can kind of control it very easily. So it gives IT the control that it wants over, being, over what people are using and also allows a very strong business technology focus to effectively a task-based interface. So we'll kind of get into that a little bit more. And then um, the last thing is uh, Active Directory. Most of us know Active Directory. There's both Azure Active Directory right now, which is really taken off. Um, but Active Directory um, controls the app portal. And so you can actually control uh, what tiles people see and the data that they're seeing. So um, you are effectively able to take someone's job and stick it into an app. And then I will see a slightly different version of it than, say, my boss or my direct reports. 
And so that kind of level of control and flexibility, also very important from an IT standpoint, but it delivers a lot of business technology value as well because I want to actually give someone an application that's really relevant to them and they don't have to learn, like, they don't need to know what my stuff is. So that for me has been um, kind of cool. So as I mentioned, building it is uh, not super duper uh, complex. Um, you can go to the enterprise site. There's a whole set of pages on here. There's a demo of how they work. Um, and you can um, download the building a Windows app portal guide. There's a couple hundred pages of kind of what it is and how to do it, code samples, all that kind of stuff. Um, I have had customers, many customers build them on their own. Um, there are partners building them like crazy all over the place. Hundreds are being sort of generated all the time. And then um, Microsoft Consulting Services also has a practice in it as well. Um, some customers who want to be more, really more robust with what they're doing will engage MCS for maybe the architectural work, a partner for the implementation work, and their own IT team for the interface work. Like I've seen that happen a lot. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, up to you. Um, and like I said, you know, it's free. So do kind of what you want. Um, so I want to talk about some demos now. I want to kind of get to it. And what I want to start with is the very first one we ever built, which was about um, two years ago. And um, there we go. So I'm just going to log into this machine here. Okay, and I'm going to switch to surface link. Yes. All right, we're rocking this. All right, so this is the very first app portal we ever built. And the way it came about was um, we actually had uh, our, uh, our president, Judson, who actually kicked off you know, Judson's, I'm um, in Judson's sort of team. I report to Allison Watson. Um, who is the uh, CVP, runs MNO, and she reports to Judson. And Judson uh, came to us from uh, Oracle about two years ago. And uh, when he arrived, he was like, wow, there's a lot of stuff for me to learn at Microsoft. It's kind of complicated. And every time he asked a question, someone would say, go over here, go over there, here's this report, here's that report. And quite frankly, he found it incredibly confusing. Uh, and um, the challenge with Microsoft versus you know, many other companies is that we have a very broad portfolio and relatively complex enterprise. Um, we found that to be more true than we thought maybe at the time uh, across other companies, but certainly for Judson it was quite overwhelming. So he said, I really want everything pulled together in one place. And so, um, so over about eight weeks, we pulled together this application, uh, which was sort of the first implementation of app portals, and we were able to do it because Windows 8.1 when it came out, it really lit up most of the app portal features. Tile control, Active Directory control, most of the stuff I just talked about really was an 8.1 uh, feature set as opposed to the, the original 8, uh, which was charitably early. Uh, so, um, but 8.1 is awesome. I, I, I love it. Uh, anyway, so, um, so basically, uh, I'll give you just kind of a quick sort of nickel tour of this thing. And so there are a whole pile of web resources that are built for sellers. Uh, and so this is like the, um, this is a site called GearUp, which is what our sellers use to um, train and sort of learn about new products, which is um, a great site. Um, we also have things like Microsoft Experience Center, which is um, a thing that allows people to experience an immersive event that allows them to really understand the products and how they could work in their enterprise. Uh, so these are all just websites. I can kind of keep clicking through them. But, you know, the amazing thing, and this will sound almost kind of weird in a way, but for many of our sellers, they didn't know all of, no seller knew all the places they needed to go. They all knew most of them, but no one knew all of them. And I've never had a conversation with a seller, and we've got about 7,000 people using this now, where they haven't said, you know, the coolest thing is I found out about blank because I was in the app portal. Because effectively, we were trying to compose the seller's job into one place. Um, the one thing that we didn't do early on, but came basically by request later on, is people said, hey, you know, I need to be on sort of Yammer all the time, or I need to use Skype, right? So can you, can you put the applications right in there? These applications are still on the start menu, but I really want to put them right inside my environment because I want to live inside this effectively sub-start screen. And so, um, so, that's what, uh, so that's what we did. And uh, people have, have loved that. And, and for me, that was like the really big insight that people wanted to create simplicity in their interface and they wanted it to be more task-based around their job. 
Um, then we had sort of things to where we could actually create, um, this is actually something called a simple scorecard. So like many businesses, we have a scorecard that we run. And you can actually sort of take it by region, go by district, and then go to different account team units. And you can see, you know, effectively Judson very quickly can go through and see who needs a phone call, which looks like most of this list. Uh, and so, um, so he'll be busy tonight. Um, but the EBG simple scorecard was a really neat way of basically pulling data in. In the end, we've actually been pulling, we pulled data in from 54 different systems into this one interface, but have been able to create you know, a relatively manageable sort of information piece. Uh, other things which were kind of interesting bits of information in the organization, we have always had what different people, different people attached to different companies, had done with us. We've always had that information. There was no really clean way for a seller to interface with it, so we just created this you know, very simple sort of, sort of view here, which is basically go to any company here, and I can go and I can see, hey, these are all the people who've done something. They've gone to a webinar, they've downloaded a white paper, they went to a conference like Convergence, and a lot of sellers have come up to me and said, man, that is amazing. I'm just about to talk to that person, and I actually can talk to them about that Azure white paper they downloaded and understand why. So that's been really helpful. My favorite part of it, though, is all this pipeline and attainment stuff. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but I'm just going to kind of do pipeline for a minute. And, and we found that people need information at differing levels. And so basically, I need to be able to understand maybe my pipeline at that top 10 level. I'm running down the hallway. Justin's going to go see KT. What are my top 10 deals? I may also need to understand it in slightly more, this is kind of like top 200, 250. And maybe I want to sort of play with this. You know, maybe I want to just basically be able to you know, sort this. I can actually have, so basically I can draw sorts and I can do this by due month. And I've got now a very interesting touch base interface. So we were talking about Nui a little while ago, right? And what we're finding is that even in business applications, getting more natural and getting more touch base in these applications becomes really important. But what that doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that we can kind of, you know, abandon or ignore the more traditional interfaces because, you know, maybe I want to do way more detailed analysis on this, and so I'll actually bring up Excel. So now this is going to, going to load for a second because it's bringing up PowerView. Uh, but now it'll bring up Excel, and now this is actually a, the PowerView plugin that's in Excel, which is free. Um, but now I can go in and I can look at this. Um, the whole Excel table is behind it. Um, I can click on the 60% stage here, and you can see all these things are contextual and they, they adjust naturally. Um, I can also go in if I wanted to, and I can go in, I can map it. So there's a power map functionality in here, which allows me to see my deals you know, sort of across the country. Uh, if you haven't played with power map, it's also free, ton of fun. It's all touch based, you can play with it. And I, sometimes I just do this just for fun. It's kind of weird, I guess. And then uh, you can stop it and say, well, what's going on there? And then it'll bring up a little flag and show you what's happening with that deal. Um, and so, so we're, you saw what I did there, right? Kind of top 10, top 250, touch base, kind of goof around with it. Geez, I got to get into Excel, get right into Excel. Now you'll notice Excel launched off the desktop. Remember I was talking about Windows? So that launched off the desktop. Right? The other things were occurring within, um, w there's some web, and then the other things were just inside the actual app itself. So we're basically dancing across different interface styles without forcing someone to go to the desktop or to go to the web or to go to a specific place. They can just operate within one context. So that was kind of fun. And then the last thing is we, of course, um, use Dynamics as our CRM application. And so I can just hit any opportunity ID, and then it goes straight to Dynamics. What's neat about this is it's loosely coupled. Okay, as opposed to having to integrate deeply into it, I can actually just do a call between these two applications. And then as we maybe upgrade, switch, or change our CRM uh, systems, you know, not the manufacturer of, but you know, we're obviously always changing, upgrading, and making it better. You know, I can just do that really easily. And for the sellers, what they love is that they can just go down here and they can just you know, quickly change and look at different opportunities. Um, you know, Yammer's now built into it, so I can see uh, what's happening from a conversation standpoint there. I can go down to my sort of social inside view stuff. And so the, the, that was kind of our first experience with um, app portals. And, uh, and we basically built it for ourselves. Right? We basically built it for ourselves. Uh, and then Justin was using it all the time, and he was in the field, and he was showing customers. And customers were like, I have a complicated enterprise too. I have tons of heterogeneous systems that don't connect to each other. I have lots of users who don't know where to go to find stuff. I have stuff that's running on the desktop, stuff that's running on the web. Now, now I'm building all these modern apps. None of this stuff gen you know, connects together. I have the same problem. And so, um, so we thought, oh, that's interesting. So we started to... Um, 
build a few others. And so I'm going to give you just kind of a, a few, uh, few uh, examples of these. Um, this is one that's brand new, and this is one that we did for our most recent CIO summit. So we have a CIO summit every spring and fall, and so this was, um, this was our, um, about two weeks ago we had this. And so you'll see with this one, what they've done is they, they had to collect all the information that CIOs at the summit would want to have about different products and different kind of categories. You can see the groupings are called security and privacy, and productivity, data, all the basic stuff people are interested in. And what, what I find interesting about this one is that um, we also find that it's very hard to have a canonical website that has everything in it that everyone wants. And so basically what you can do is you can effectively create a whole pile of disassociated assets and pull them together into one view. Uh, so I can go here and I can sort of look at sort of low-cost devices and, um, and that'll, that'll launch a site on Microsoft Enterprise. Um, I can, you know, kind of Jabra is one of the sponsors of the show, so we can go to their site, which is kind of neat. Uh, it's all within the same context, though. Um, I can actually, um, what I kind of think is kind of fun is I can also just um, go here. This is just another Microsoft Azure site. And you can see we're kind of effectively parsing the complexity and putting it into an interface that's uh, a lot easier to understand. You know, same thing here. You can go through, and you can also kind of have this thing on the side, and then this thing's just loading the sites uh, over over here. Uh, also can load the PDF, so now you can see there's a PDF here, that's your, know, and then you've got a video. The new sales world yeah. demands we work. Kill that. So, and then basically what we've been able to do is create this kind of really interesting experience where everything people wanted uh, was all in one, one place. Um, and so I thought that was kind of an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, then the, um, then our friends at, um, and our friends at Intel, they loved it too. So when they were at CES, they said, you know, we would love something where we can put our stage schedule in so people know where they need to go uh, for the stage. Uh, we'd love to have, you know, the Intel Twitter site in place. You know, that would be really great to have in sort of one interface. Um, it would be really nice to have, you know, our sort of videos in there as well so they have these things popping open. Um, hey, and we've also got all these sort of things we want to talk about on our site. So, you know, I really want to be able to show what my two-in-one stories are, what my mini PC story is. And, uh, and we've got this really fantastic ad campaign right now. I want to be able to go through that and show all the different the ads thing. that are running. And that was, this was the, what they used at the booth in CES. They had them on tablets, um, you know, teeny weeny ones. They had them on all the desktops. They had them on all the machines. It was awesome, right? And it was one of these things where, again, they were aggregating things that were launching from all sorts of different places, but they were able to bring it into sort of one view and one sort of simple interface. Um, so, so let me show you something that's kind of sort of way out there. And then I'm going to show you what I work on uh, every day. So this is, a, um, this is a kiosk version. So this is a kiosk application. It was a, it's a musical. And what they do in this musical is they hand out Toshiba 8-inch tablets to everyone who walks in the theater. And then people interact with those before the show and during the show and after the show. And they actually tweet from the stage and do all sorts of cool things. And so this is what the interface is. And the only thing you can do is press the start button here. And then what they have here is they have, you know, they have their um, they have the Twitter feed, and it's like, oh, look at that. It actually looks like they retweeted me. And uh, this is their Twitter feed here. And uh, there, there I am right there. Would you like fries with that Windows app portal? Yeah, there we go. On the yeah, see? I think the answer would be yes. Uh, and, um, and they have a whole these other disassociated apps. They've got, you know, they've got a YouTube page. They've got a Facebook page. And so they've got all the same problems everyone else has, where everyone has all these different assets in all these different places. Um, they also have, you know, kind of a merchandise page. And so they created, like, a general merchandise page, but they also created individual tiles for individual pieces of merchandise. And what, for me, that kind of, there's a little bit of a twist there, which is, hey, you don't just have to send someone to the front door. You can also send them in the side doors as well. And if you break that up, it's a lot more interesting from a user standpoint. And they sell a lot of teddy bears. Um, they also have the sort of PowerPoint online thing for trivia. And then there's a whole bunch of, like, basically fake businesses that they've created that their characters work for, like, or own. It Claire's by Claire is owned by someone named Meg. The whole joke about why why Meg doesn't use her real name, why she calls it Claire, et cetera. But then they have, like, oh, they've been able to build this universe, and they put that in there. Uh, everyone knows what a playbill is, you know, so the playbill's right here, and they have that right in there, and then they built a video player. And so you can actually go in there, and you can, before the show, people were watching trailers of sort of some of their uh, favorite uh, chick flicks. Um,
My name is Tim. Funny scene, actually. This is the year that would change my life forever. Happy New Year! Happy oh. New Year! So close. I just didn't know it yet. <laughs> so anyway, you get the idea. And again, they parsed the YouTube thing as well, so you could go directly to uh, to a video as opposed to having to go through the main interface. And so that's another way where they've taken a bunch of different things and brought them into sort of one task-based type of interface, which is, uh, I thought, pretty neat. So now let me talk about what, uh, what I use every day. And um, this, is my, um, this is my app portal for my job. And so this is literally my entire job in one place. So, and uh, this is actually on the live system right now. So. Uh, I may close some things really quickly. Uh, I, I'm pretty good at knowing where to go and where not to go, but this is uh, just connected right into uh, CorpNet at Microsoft. And so, um, and there's a lot of stuff in here. So I'm just going to really quickly, uh, this is not the demo, so I'm just going to just do this for, for effect, okay? So there's a lot in here, because this is my whole job, okay? So, so all the stuff in here I have to deal with, okay? You know. Actually, I do love my job, though. I'm not complaining about my job. I'm just saying this is all stuff I have to worry about. And it is kind of nice because you know, it is relaxing knowing that every single thing I need to do is here and all the different jumping off points. Some of these will go to, like if I go to, um, if I go here, this will go to my desktop and launch my OneNote. And this OneNote is, I've got a lot of stuff in here, obviously, but this OneNote has got all my, my playbook and all my operations stuff, which we update every quarter. Um, and I'm not going to go any deeper than this page, but, uh, but, but it's like, I don't, instead of like, where, where is that one node? Or I just launch it from here. I don't need to worry about that. Then we also have um, uh, an ROB. So we have a rhythm of business that's reasonably complex. Uh, and so what it does is the rhythm of business is just built into Outlook. So we just use Outlook for our rhythm of business. Uh, so it just goes straight to Outlook and goes to my ROB calendars, which makes a ton of sense, obviously. Uh, if I want to see the most current ads that we're running, you know, this is our Russell Wilson ad for Surface. Uh, you know, all the stuff that I want to sort of look at from that standpoint is in here. Um, and then, of course, we run a pretty sophisticated operation from a marketing automation standpoint. And so um, I don't know how many of you have been able to go to the MDM demos, but this is a look at... This is inside my live uh, MDM system right now. So I'll, I'm not going to do a full MDM demo, but I'll give you kind of a sense of what I do with it. What I like about uh, MDM and just general marketing automation systems is they allow me to build a lot of if-then statements and a lot of branching logic. Because the problem in marketing is that whenever you do something, most people don't respond to it. And, and typically, before marketing automation came along, typically we would focus on the three, four, five, ten percent of people who would respond to something and follow that linear path. But it's the 95 percent who don't respond that are actually more interesting because you can hit them again or you can do something else or try a different stimuli or whatever, and then you can see if they respond or not and then keep kind of following down that path. A well-built marketing automation journey map, which is what I'm, I'm showing you right now, uh, this would be deeper than it would be wide. Right? So that's the, uh, sort of the, the operating principle of that. And then, um, and then this, is actually, this is actually a piece we're building right now for Convergence. And so as people you know, leave Convergence, um, there will be a thank you. You'll get a thank you. Um, and then we'll wait a day and probably do something else. And so the way my team would build this is they would just sort of drag an activity over here, which would be an email. Um, we have a lot of pre-built emails in the system, so I could just click on my post-convergence recorded sessions, click on select there. Now I've got that in place. What happens if people do or don't do that? Well, I go back to activities, and what I'll want to do is pop in a trigger. And the trigger's there. And watch what I do when I do this. So when I let go of this, what it's going to do is going to automatically create an if-then statement right away. Boom, right? So now, obviously, people spend more than 30 seconds on this. Um, but you can see how fast it is. And I think what uh, our team's really enjoyed about MDM is the, the, the sort of the journey map has been the part that they've focused on primarily and made it really easy to build a lot of branching logic. So that, anyway, that's part of what I do. Now, all the stuff in marketing automation needs to come from somewhere. And digital asset management is usually the way that's managed in most companies. And so we have an Azure-based uh, digital asset management system for the whole company. And this is it. Uh, and I'll let me pull this over a bit just to get a full view. Um, and so these are like literally, you can see the numbers on the left. These are, in some cases, thousands of pieces of content from around the world uh, in Microsoft, all stored in one Azure uh, database. And then I can save searches. Uh, so I'm going to go to 
a current campaign running right now, which is our Cloud for Government campaign. And these are all the pieces uh, are in there. Some of these are actually from China, some are from Latin America, some are from Germany. Um, this piece here, you can actually see this is a, a US campaign. It's a video. If I want to quickly preview it, I can just kind of press this little button here. The real question that needs to be asked is what is it that we can do that is impactful? What the cloud enables is computing to empower cancer researchers. It used to take two weeks to sequence and analyze a genome. With the Microsoft Cloud, we can analyze 100 per day. Whatever I can do to help compute a cure for cancer, uh, that's what I'd like to do. Yeah, kind of cool. So I like that piece and I might use it. So, so that's kind of another thing that I access. And so you see, just in the last sort of three or four minutes, I've danced between the desktop, OneNote, my calendar, I'm in my Azure Cloud Dam, I'm in my marketing automation system, but all these things are coming through an interface where I'm basically able to perform tasks. And I'm not going to spend too much more time, maybe one or two other quick things I'll show you. We do run a social command center, so this is something that is, um, my team runs the social command center uh, for, um, for the world. So about 20 different major Microsoft products uh, run through this. And you can see uh, here, these are all uh, email, uh, Twitter and Facebook posts that we're sending out. And these are all things that people are saying about us coming in. And so this is like a few seconds ago. So you can see these are I'm always risky when I do this. But, uh, <laughs> but it looks like so far, OK, pretty positive. And, so, and these, are, these are all um, hashtag uh, convergence15. So that's why this is fairly significant stream coming in there. And then that micro content I showed you a second ago through the Cloud Dam, we actually build content to respond to people um, you know, in these social feeds. And so some of that is there and that refreshes. There's an RSS feed and you can see the volume. We, we actually triage or look at about 12 million uh, messages a year through the Social Command Center. That's what's kind of going on there. So I can see what's kind of going on. We have a, a center in San Jose and one in Seattle, and I can sort of see what's going on at a moment's notice. But I also want to really j drill into what they're doing, volumes and that kind of stuff. Then I can go right into Power BI, and then it'll launch Excel, and it'll get me into kind of another Power BI view, similar to what I was showing you um, in the sales uh, version a few minutes ago. Uh, and so that, for me, is a, there's, a, there's a really powerful idea of having this sort of interface that lies across it that's effectively my job uh, in a box. Uh, all of our teams are here, and uh, sort of so on and so on. One thing I did promise is I got a few people um, requesting that I approve a few things. And I've been super excited and having a really awesome time at Convergence, so I got a tiny bit behind. And so I got a specific message from Hina. And so she said, can you approve this? So I am going to actually approve this right now. So because I said I would do it around 4.10. It's 4.20, so I'm about 10 minutes later. But, and then what's neat, and I, I know this sounds really kind of um, sort of pedantic in some ways, but I got to tell you, it's crazy awesome that all my places I need to go to approve stuff is all together. As stupid as that sounds, I get more bounce, more feedback from people being, that would be great, versus chasing it all down, and we've grouped it all together. And I just can do that. I can clear that group in the middle of a meeting and stay on top of it. And then um, this is what we need to do to do an event. My team organized this event, so um, obviously a lot of stuff that happens to make that all happen. And you know, other things like privacy and invoices and all that kind of stuff. So that's sort of my job in a box. Now, one of the things that people say is like, geez, I love this idea. Uh, what I'd love to do is I'd love to be able to show someone back at my um, organization what we could do. How do I help envision it? So, because to build a full-fledged one, they, they go, they range in sort of service costs, because like I said, there's no license cost, but they range in service costs from, I think we've spent, that Chick Flick one probably cost around $15,000. Uh, the CIO Summit and the Intel ones are probably around $30,000. Um, if you're integrating a ton of back-end systems and doing a lot of middle sort of layer stuff, you could spend several hundred thousand dollars on data management, right? So, but the interface itself is not super expensive to pull together. But there's still this sort of piece which is, you know, how do I, hmm, how do I uh, show people what, what it would be like? And so we created something called an App Portal Prototype Generator. It allows you to create a prototype, and there's also an App Portal prototype viewer that's available in the Windows Store, that you can create a prototype and then very easily show people, hey, this is what we could do. So is anyone here from healthcare? OK, I probably shouldn't have. Oh, come on up. Come on up. Who's from healthcare and wants to come on the stage? Come on up. OK, of you know. OK. Anyone else want to come up? OK. 
No? Okay, I'm going to keep going. Okay, so I'm just going to do it myself. So I worked for many years at New York Presbyterian Hospital. I was in healthcare for a long, long time. And, uh, and so I'm just going to create a little file name. This file name here is going to be uh, just my internal file name. Nothing super fancy here. It's just a date. And then I'm going to choose the industry. So, boom, healthcare. And um, we're going to be, uh, let's be the nurse. And we'll continue there. And then we're going to, now we're going to title it. So, um, so we're going to actually go NYPH. Uh, app portal, and uh, we're going to do a, a Bing search to uh, find a logo. So it's YPH logo, and um, I'm going to use that one, and then um, I can now customize tiles. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but I can actually go into each one of these titles and uh, and change them, right? So I can go at NYPH, NYP hospital. And um, I can actually you know, change every single one of these tiles. They all fly in and fly out. So I can just kind of have some fun with that if I want to. Um, then I can add applications. And this is the part for me that's been really useful because you know, we found, as we did our research, that our customers actually use software from other vendors. Ah, so <laughs> what's that all about? Uh, so, uh, so we've got some in here. And so we can say, hey, you know, we, we, the Cornell campus uses Epic at uh, NYP. Um, McKesson is in use in some of the smaller places. Meditech is being played with a little bit. Um, they use Oracle Financials. Those are all sort of desktop things. They've got a bunch of modern stuff. They love the Bing Health and Fitness app. And then from a um, web application standpoint, um, I think, uh, let's see which one, Workday is their HR system. So they can kind of add in stuff that you know, looks like their environment. Um, like that. And uh, I think. And then what, what that'll do, whoop, there you are. Okay, so and there is uh, sort of a prototype app portal. Now, it's not like you can deploy this to production right away, but, you know, it actually does have, you know, the Twitter feed in there. Like, you can actually see the NYPH and Microsoft and Health right now. Uh, you can actually see, you know, there's, there's a website that will go for that as well. Um, they've got the applications that we put in from the other folks as well. They've got some dynamic stuff in here. Um, you've got something that you can actually play with. And so being able to sort of prototype these really quickly and kind of have some fun with it uh, was, we thought, pretty interesting. We found this to be incredibly popular. Our partners use them like crazy. Um, and our salespeople, it was designed originally, um, I said the design parameter was, you know, I'm a seller. I'm sitting in the parking lot. I'm going to go see my customer in 10 minutes. I'm in Winnipeg. I was originally Canadian, as you can probably tell. I'm in Winnipeg. It's snowing. It's minus 30 degrees. And I'm tethered to my phone. That's that's my scenario, okay, and I want to build something cool to have a discussion with the customer. So that's kind of what a lot of people have actually, I've told that story a couple times, and I have gotten pictures of people in their cars in a snowstorm tethered to their phone building out portals, and they said, yes, that does work. Uh, and that is effectively kind of the sort of the story. And so um, let me just um, kind of wrap up by talking. I, I did mention quickly that, um, oops, sorry. I did mention quickly that uh, this is where you want to go to find out more. Um, and obviously, uh, you can come up to me after the presentation. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, and I want to just end with, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about interface. And um, I've, I've kind of gone to something very practical. So app portals you can build today. Uh, HoloLens is coming soon. And that's as much as I can say. Um, but that's coming soon. I've touched one, if that's worth mentioning. I actually held it in my hands. Uh, and then it was ripped out of my hands very quickly. But I did hold it for a moment. Uh, and um, that's going to be super exciting. So that's kind of near future. Uh, and obviously, there'll be a lot of building. This is sort of probably slightly farther future. This is an internal Microsoft research video. It's going to be super geeky. These are a couple of these people are my friends. OK, it's super geeky because it was made for uh, us to show each other. OK, this is not made for public presentation. But I like it because it's sort of uh, thematically I it's sort of interesting. And I think you can just imagine what the world will be like uh, when every surface becomes a computing surface. It may also make you understand the word surface a bit more and why we use that. Lightspace explores a variety of interactions and computational strategies related to interactive displays in the space they inhabit, touching on aspects of multi-touch interactive displays, augmented reality, and smart rooms. Lightspace uses three PrimeSense depth sensing cameras and three standard projectors. These are arranged to cover most of an office-sized space 
and are precisely calibrated to real-world coordinates of the room. We use this basic infrastructure to explore a number of interactions on, above, and between interactive surfaces placed in the room. First, the user may view and manipulate virtual objects on this tabletop, which is just a regular desk. Also, there is a wall display that functions similarly. Here, the surface is just a piece of foam core. Beyond simulating the behavior of interactive displays such as surface, we consider interactions that involve the space between surfaces. For example, our user can move an object from one surface to another by touching the object in the destination surface in that order. An object may also be picked up by sweeping it into the hand. The object is depicted as a sphere that can be held and rolled on the hands and arms. The object may be dropped on this piece of cardboard and handed from one person to another. The held object can be dropped directly on an interactive surface. It may also be placed on an interactive surface by touching the destination with one hand while holding the object in the other. We have also implemented a menu that is organized in space. The spatial menu is invoked by holding a hand in the column of space directly over the menu graphic on the floor. Menu selection changes as the hand is moved up and down in this column. Note that the text of the menu is oriented toward the user for easier reading. A menu item may be selected by pausing briefly at the selection. Lightspace has only scratched the surface of interactions made possible by the combination of depth cameras and projectors. So, just imagine that really built out, right? There's nothing on your body, supernatural interaction, and effectively every surface becomes a computing surface. So, I think it's pretty exciting. Like I said, I love being in this industry. I love being in this industry right now, and we're at just the very beginning of what I think will be an explosion over the next decade as we basically take computers and turn them into a more natural extension of our humanity versus something that we conform ourselves to. And that's a very, very interesting switch. Um, if you kind of want to follow me, um, you may not after this, but if you do, uh, I, do have a, I do have a website called CopernicanShift.com, uh, not surprisingly, if you've been listening. Uh, so feel free to sort of check that out. And um, we'll run these little uh, videos. Let's give you a little taste of uh, my, my little web series. Randy did this for me. Welcome to the wonderful hey. world of marketing. I'm your host, Grad Khan, as always. Because that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about The Walking Dead. And I know that uh, Randy's excited about editing this uh, because you know, he'll be able to edit lots of zombie shots in. And you know, by the way, Randy, you've got free reign to get as gross as you want. All right, so it was a lot of fun. Thank you very much for coming out.